diversion from Colossians, in light of our intention to appoint Mike and Tim, elders as well as Nick as a deacon, I thought it'd be prudent to teach some things that the Bible says about spiritual leadership in the church. God wants every one of his children to understand his design for the local church, and certainly the area of leadership is, is important to these things. And so you can take your Bible tonight and open it to Ephesians chapter 1 to begin with. Ephesians chapter 1. As we begin, I have a question on your handout. Who is the head of the church? And if you're familiar with the scriptures, you know the answer to that already. Well, we can see that from the scriptures. Beginning in Ephesians 1, we can pick it up in verse 18. Paul here praying for these believers. It says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things, notice, to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. You know, one of the themes of the book of Ephesians is uh, the church. It clarifies the mystery of the church. And here in this particular spot in the epistle, he identifies who the head of the church is. It's none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if we turn over to Colossians chapter 1, which is kind of a twin epistle, it's a shortened version in many ways of what we read in Ephesians. Paul states some things here, beginning in verse, we can pick it up in verse 15. He, relative to Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn for the dead, the word beginning there means originator, that in all things he may have the preeminence. But both in Ephesians 1 and here, we see that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. In fact, in verse 18, it says he's the firstborn from the dead. In, verse 15, in fact, the word firstborn in both verse 15 and both verse 18 is a Greek word prototokos and refers to and this is important because the Mormons and the Jehovah Witnesses messed this up it refers to a specific position or rank it does not refer to an event in time so it's not like he's the firstborn it's speaking of his position position if Paul wanted to say Jesus Christ was first created, he could have used the Greek word protoklistos, which he did not use. Instead, the Holy Spirit employed prototokos, which refers to supreme position in a family as the father's heir. You know, on a human level, normally the firstborn male in a Jewish household would be the heir and the father, and he'd get a double inheritance. And, but if he screwed up, uh, he could lose that or forfeit that inheritance. And then someone else could become, quote, firstborn or first in rank to receive the inheritance. And, you know, Psalm 89 really makes this clear what it, the intent of the word is. Psalm 89, verses 20 through 27 read, I have found David my servant with my holy oil I have anointed him with whom my hand shall be established. Mine arm shall also strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. And in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set 
his hand also in the sea, and his right hand in the rivers. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. So we have the same word in Hebrew, but it's, again, this is a messianic psalm. And, uh, I mean, through Bathsheba, Solomon was the heir to the throne on a human level. But Messiah himself is going to be, quote, firstborn, have a position of rank higher than the kings of the earth. And so when you see that term firstborn, it's talking about a position, not an event in time. And so Jesus Christ is the head of the church. He's the firstborn. In fact, Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2 say, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed, notice, heir of all things, through whom he also made the worlds. Jesus Christ is the firstborn. He's first in rank. He is the heir of all things. And so he's the head of the church. He's God. He's the originator. He's the sovereign ruler and heir of it. He alone is worthy of this because he alone died for our sins and rose again from the dead. So if you're part of the church, this means you belong to Christ and he is your head. And I can emphasize, I guess, the word the there because technically you could be a member of any, every church in town and still not be part of Christ and his church. You know, a verse I haven't talked about in a while is Romans 8, 9. Talking to, the, talking to the Romans, Paul says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to him. And so one of the marks of ownership that God owns you and that Christ owns you and Christ is your head is that the Holy Spirit lives in you. And so a question logically could be asked, well, how does one get the Holy Spirit? Now, if you were part of a, another religious organization, they could see, they would say how you get the Holy Spirit is different than what the Bible says. You know, in Ephesians 1, we read, In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, whom also, having believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, was the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. And so receiving the Holy Spirit has something to do with a person that you trust. In fact, it has something to do with you trust this person after you hear some specific information. You heard the word of truth, notice the gospel of your salvation. And so when someone hears the gospel of their salvation, they hear that truth, and they trust Christ, they receive the Holy Spirit. You know, the Bible is very clear that God is holy. He's perfectly pure and righteous in every way. He's just. And he loved the world, and we're all part of that world that he loved. And as part of the world, we're born of the world. We're born separated from God. And to show our need of our Savior, God gave us the Ten Commandments that told us some things not to do, which we've all done. Don't lie, don't steal, don't covet, don't murder, don't disobey your mom and dad. We've done those. We're a liar, we're thieves, uh, and so forth, which means we're guilty sinners before God. And so sin separates us from a holy God, and that sin needs to be removed. We deserve death. We deserve to be separated from God forever in an unthinkable place of horror called hell or the lake of fire. And yet God is a God of love. He's not only perfectly right, righteous and holy and just, he's also a loving God. And so he gave. God so literally gave his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died in your place and mine and rose again. And the reason he had to die is because the wages of sin is death. And so on the cross, Jesus Christ died for all sins, for all men, for all time. And he cried out, it is finished, which means paid in full, which means God's justice was satisfied. The wrath of God that you and I deserve to pay was poured out on Christ. He paid the bill in full. And so the issue is, will you put your faith in him? That's what trust means. When you trust or rely on Christ, you receive eternal life. You're forgiven of all your trespasses. You will not go to hell. And you have passed from death onto life all by the grace of God. And so, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't belong to Christ, which means you're not going to heaven, and Christ is not your head, in a technical sense of the word. 
But notice, having believed, the moment you believe that's an heiress participle, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit is a mark of ownership. It's a guarantee of our inheritance. And this is the praise of his glory. And so the moment you got saved, Christ owned you. In fact, 1 Corinthians makes that clear. Paul, in admonishing the Corinthians, says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And notice you are not your own. For you were bought at a price or with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. See, the moment you got saved, God owned you, and he placed you into his body. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 and 13 say, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all, notice, baptized or placed into Christ, into one body. doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Greek or a slave or a free person. We've all been made to drink of that one spirit. And so the moment you got saved, what happened to you was you were placed into Christ. You believe in Christ. The Spirit of God places you into Christ. Christ is now your head. You're part of the body of Christ, which means we're connected to each other, and we're also connected to the head. This is what the church is. So Christ is the head of the church. We're members one of another. And Christ is the head which means we're all under Christ's authority. We're all under the authority of his word. And so when you think about it, the leaders of a church, we're going to talk about spiritual leadership, are never referred to as the head of the church. And the church is never viewed as a democratic organization where members are free to vote their own minds on issues. See, the key question in church leadership is not what is the mind of the members, but what is the mind of Christ and are the leaders working in such a way so that they are directing you according to the principles of God's word? So the church is under the authority of Christ. This is how we need to be careful how we treat it. This is why our mindset should be, Lord, what is your will? We want to submit to his program. He, we want him to direct in the affairs of the local church because he's the head. And so spiritual leadership is designed to follow biblical principles in the word of God so that the head is honored through those decisions. You know, the church is a living organism. It's not an organization. You know, Webster defines an organization as an administrative and functional structure. He defines an organism as individual, an individual constituted to carry out the activities of life by means of organs separate in function but mutually dependent. That's what your body is. That's what the body of Christ is. We're a living organism. Now an organism is organized, but it's more than that. It's living, it's responsive, it's responsive to your head. Your head directs the actions of your body. Jesus Christ is the head, and he's directing the actions of the body of the church. And just like your body is to be submissive to the directions of your brain, uh, the principle is parallel. As believers in Christ, we're to be mutually dependent in interaction, interacting with one another, so the will of the head can be carried out in a way that honors him. And so the main function of spiritual leader, leadership is to allow Christ to exercise his headship over the church. And so that's how we are to view church leadership. It's different than conducting a a business. And again, you can't view a church as a democratic organization where every member has a right to vote because that's not how God designed this thing. That's like my hand voting on whether or not my brain could direct my hand. And then we have a spastic situation and all this other thing going on, right? And so I'm going to talk about spiritual leadership here. I'm going to begin with talking about some names. So we can go back to Ephesians and go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. There's three different terms that are used interchangeably when it comes to spiritual leadership in the church. And the first is the pastor. The pastor 
is referred to scriptures as a pastor teacher and it's emphasized the, his ministry as a shepherd. As a shepherd. Notice chapter 4, verse 11. And he, Christ, this is the resurrected Christ, he gave gifts to the church according to verse 7. It says that each one is grace was given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And what did he do, verse 11? He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and notice some pastors and teachers. Now you have the word pastor and teacher separated with the word and, and a lot of Greek scholars believe that this is, fits the Granville Sharp rule, which means it's a grammatical construction that says that when, you, when the nouns agree in case, number, and gender, thank you, that they are equal. So it's like an equal sign. And so there's pastors and teachers are pastor teachers. And when we think of the role of the pastor teacher, it's largely determined by the terms used in the Bible to describe him. You know, apart from the word of God and what it says, we could all have an opinion on what we think a pastor should be and what a pastor should be doing. I mean, that's going on everywhere. And the things that people think a pastor should be doing could be absolutely in conflict with each other. But this emphasized the mentality that the pastor is to have. It's, he's a shepherd. That's really what they mean. The word pastor, poimen, literally means a shepherd. And his ministry and gifts involves teaching the word of God. That's why it's pastor slash teacher. This emphasizes his ministry. He's to be teaching the word of God. In fact, that word is related to poimeni, which means a flock of sheep. Literally, is one who herds sheep and tends to flocks as a shepherd. And metaphorically, that word refers to one who performs functions including feeding, oversight, protection, leading, and guiding. This is what a shepherd does to sheep in a literal sense in the material world. And that's part of the function of what a pastor, teacher, or elders to do in the church of Jesus Christ. And so the primary responsibility of a shepherd or a pastor in a local church is to teach the word of God. Teach the word of God. Now it's possible to have the gift of teaching and not pastoring. All pastors have to be teachers, but not all teachers are pastors. And so there's teachers that can function a local church without having the responsibility of shepherding the flock. And that's true of Sunday school teachers, for example. It's true of women that teach other women. But teachers here is a Greek word, didaskalos, and it means teach to shape the will of the one being taught by the content of what is taught. It's an instructor, master, teacher, one who provides instruction. And so these are spiritual gifts, by the way. God gifts uh, certain people with this ability to explain what the Bible says, interpret what it means, and apply it in the hearts and consciences to the saints, to tell you where it fits. But it has to be, all of this has to be centered on the word of God. If the pastor doesn't concentrate and center his ministry on the teaching of the word of God, he might be a nice man, he might be a godly man, but he's not doing the main work of a shepherd. You know, and back then, even in Christ's day, and how this would have been understood in Christ's time is that they didn't simply teach information or open up new ways of thought. They not only taught information, but they urged their hearers to apply it, to understand it, and to to apply it in their life. And so part of the pastor teacher is not only to explain what it says, but show you how it fits and then encourage you to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. And Paul made this abundantly clear in the last epistle he wrote to Timothy. And he said quite forcefully, I charge you. I can't say it any stronger. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, the two highest people in the universe, and they're going to judge the living and the dead that is appearing in his kingdom, Christ is. 
you preach the word. And so if a pastor's worth of salt, he's going to be preaching the word of God. He needs to be ready in season and out of season. He needs to convince and rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Why? Why is this important in this context? Because the time will come when they, they, the congregation, will not endure sound doctrine. They don't want to hear it. Don't tell me the truth. Truth isn't always pretty. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, in other words, ears that want to be tickled, I want you to give me Hallmark cards to make me feel really good about myself. They're going to heap up for themselves teachers that they like. This is why I've said before, when people pick a God, they pick a God just like them. And they're going, to be, they're going to turn their ears. That's an active choice to not listen to the truth. But since the void has to be filled, what's going to fill it? They're going to be turned to passively into fables, myths, something that isn't true, and you're going to swallow it hook, line, and sinker. And so the Word of God is to have a primary spot in your thinking. You know, how important is God's Word to himself? Psalm 138, 1 and 2 say this. I bow down toward your holy temple and give you thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For notice, you have exalted above all things your name and your word. God has exalted his word above his very name is really the idea there. Very, very powerful. You know, when Jesus Christ was being tempted by Satan on the word, he quoted Deuteronomy 8.3. He answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. How does the word of God stack up in your thinking in terms of its importance to you? You know, some of the great saints said some things regarding the word of God. For example, Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 15 and verse 16, Your words were found and I ate them. And your words were to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by your name, the Lord God of hosts. Is that how you view the word of God? What did Job say? I have not departed from his command, the commandment of his lips, for I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread or my necessary food. David said what? Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Later in the psalm, he says, direct my footsteps according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. And so, do you base your decisions on principles of God's word that you've been taught? You know, by God's grace, if the pastor is teaching you the word of God in a correct manner, in context, that's the expectation, so to speak. God has put a premium on his word, and shouldn't we do the same? I mean, why did Job and Jeremiah and David put such a premium on the word of God? Well, Christ gave us the answer to that in John 8. To the Jews who had believed on him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you're, my, you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and what will that truth do for you? It'll set you free. Do you believe that? You know, the Word of God, according to Hebrews 4, is alive and powerful. It's designed to cut. It penetrates your brain. It penetrates you. It's the discerner, the critic of the thoughts and intents of your heart. This is why when you preach the Word of God, some people have a severe reaction to it because it cut them to shreds. I don't like that. I don't like that at all. And you see, the Word of God, because of its very nature and very power always demands a decision. You can put a marker here. Go with me to John 6 for a second. This is the Bread of Life Discourse. And Jesus said some very convicting things, and it wasn't well received. Notice verse 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? And when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, <laughs> they were complaining about the word of God. Did anyone ever complain about the word of God? 
He said, does this offend you? Verse 62, what then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, they are life. Do you believe we sang the song, Wonderful Words of Life? That these are life-containing words that Jesus spoke? But then he addresses Judas, verse 64. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I've said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. They didn't like what he had to say. Then Jesus said to the 12, well, are you going to go away too? But Simon, speaking for the group, said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. What a great answer. But the truth isn't always pretty. The truth can be offensive. Believers can murmur at the word of God when it steps on their toes. But the truth forces you to make a decision. A lot of disciples at this point in time said, you know what, I don't like this. I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm going to go to a place where they, the word of God doesn't offend me or whoever teaches or whoever is being spoken doesn't offend me. Peter recognized the truth isn't always pretty, and though it can be troubling and convicting at first glance, it's the truth. And again, Jesus said, you should know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You know, I like this. Peter recognized, hey, listen, where are we going to go? you got the words of eternal life. In fact, John 17, 3 says, Jesus Christ is eternal life, and we're going to spend all eternity getting to know him more. And so if that's what we're going to do, in all eternity, should our objective on earth be any less than to get to know him through his word right now? I mean, if Christ has the words of eternal life and he does, isn't it wise to listen? What would you trade it in for? And so if a pastor is worth his salt, he's going to be teaching you the word of God in context in a way that's going to equip you and edify you and challenge you and encourage you and in some cases rebuke you or what it might be but it's all done because this is God's will and that's the responsibility he's been given see we go back to Ephesians 4 here why did Christ give these gifts verse 11 says he gave himself gave some, and these are gifts again, gifted men to the church to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastor teachers. Now the New Testament apostle and prophets have passed off the scene. Ephesians 2.20 says that the church was built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. You know, everyone, I should just mention here, has received a spiritual gift the reason you've got a spiritual gift is so that the body of Christ can be edified and built up. We're all part of this. We're all part of the same body. We're all in this together. But in verse 11, it mentions leadership teaching gifts that are designed to facilitate ministry and edification and growth of the body. Now, evangelists are those who are gifted to go preach the gospel and plant churches, modern-day missionaries in ways. And then it says the Lord gave pastors and teachers. But why did he do that? Well, gifted men were given to the church for the equipping of the saints, verse 12. For the equipping of the saints, so they can do the work of ministry, so that the body of Christ can be edified. And this is to continue verse 13 till we all come to the unity of the faith and knowledge of the son of God to a mature man to measure the stature of the fullness of Christ not being tossed to and fro by and carried about by every wind of doctrine through false teaching notice verse 15 but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things to him who is the head Christ 
And so this is how God has designed his church to function. When we gather here together, the focal point should be the word of God and how the word of God is to be understood and to work in your life and to equip you. You know, the Greek word equipping is katarchismos, and it means to mend or repair, make whole or perfect, setting, used to the setting of bones or mending nets, and so forth. It means to equip fully or to make fit. So the pastor who's been gifted to do that is to equip you so you can think biblically and principally so that you can do the work of ministry. You know, you've been left here to be a minister. You know, if you don't stop and think about that, the world's got all kinds of things to tell you why you've been left here. It might be to make a money, to stick your big toe in a pool in Yuma, Arizona with a million dollars in your portfolio or whatever. I mean, you can have all kinds of objectives, and a lot of them aren't wrong in themselves, but ultimately, you've been left here to minister. You've been left here to minister. And so this equipping means to either be repairing or preparing. And the Word of God is designed to be either preparing or repairing your thinking. Both are needed. Both are needed. And you know what this necessitates is that a congregation that is mature needs to give his pastor the time he needs to study and to think and to prepare messages. And I'm so thankful that as a rule, this has been the truth here. You know, some congregations expect their pastors to be counselors and to do all this stuff, to be a personal counselor, and that's part of it, but that's not his primary role. And I don't mind counseling, but there's times when people make a mountain out of a molehill and make something that's an emergency that isn't an emergency. And I've got limited time, and then sometimes I have to spend a whole day doing something that actually the Spirit of God is trying to equip other believers to do. Not that I don't mind doing it, but if I have to do it at the expense of preparing for a message, that means something's is out of whack. Something's out of whack. You know, and I read some stats. Only one out of ten pastors actually retires as a pastor. They usually burn out. Um, you know, <laughs> found this one. Guy's got all on his plate. I couldn't find my one pace cartoon where there's the pastor's planting flowers and there's a woman over him barking at him, said, you... You said you'd go visit my son in prison. <laughs> and he's thinking he's got to clean the bathrooms and, and uh, the church. And, and people, you know, and the guy's just sweating and he's exhausted and he's thinking, what am I going to do here? You know, why am I going to bother? And this is why in South America in particular, the men are a bunch of lazy bums that don't do anything in the church. It's a cultural problem. And the women do it all. And it's not the way God designed it, but men aren't stepping up. They're bums. They're total bums. And so uninvolved men equal an overworked pastor. And the pastor ends up not building the men because he's got to do other things that God said, you're not be doing that. Other people are not supposed to be doing it. And so a mature church that understands how this is to work as a body recognizes that and gives the pastor time to study the Word of God. What else do we have? The pastor is also called an elder, emphasizing the spiritual maturity as a shepherd. These terms we're going to see are used interchangeably. Now, elder is the term presbuteros. That's where we... The Presbyterian Church is actually named for this, which means elder rule. That's really what it carries the idea here. But it speaks of maturity. It speaks of spiritual maturity. You know, the Old Testament, the word, the Hebrew word for elder, it's a Jewish term. 
occurs 162 times, and it means literally a bearded one, somewhat advanced aged. But that is not really the idea here in the New Testament church. The issue is not chronological age, but spiritual maturity. And so this is how Paul, you know, Luke used the word relative to the Apostle Paul when he established churches on his first missionary journey. It says when they, that's Paul and uh, Barnabas, when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch. These are places they already been. They strengthened the souls of the disciples. They exhorted them to continue in the faith by saying we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Don't be weary in well-doing. It's not a trip down the primrose path. And when they had appointed, notice, elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And so they went back to those churches. There was time for these, those men to grow, and then they appointed elders in those churches. Paul, in writing a letter to Titus, said, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. As different cities in the Crete had local churches, and Paul said to Titus, I want you to go appoint elders in those churches. And so that term was very familiar with, to the Jews, and that concept was carried over to the church as an elder. But again, it's not physical age, it's spiritual maturity. In fact, Timothy, who Paul wrote his last epistle to, was around 35 years old. In fact, I think it's 1 Timothy 4.12 says, Let no man despise your youth. That was considered a young man, but he was mature in the Lord, and he was considered an elder. What's the third term? pastor is also called a bishop, emphasizing his mentality as a shepherd. His mentality is, see this, go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 1. And we're going to get to this, not tonight. In fact, we're not going to get very far at all. Uh, chapter 3, verse 1. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop must be then blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospital, hospitable, able to teach. And so it's the Greek word episkopos, in fact, You've heard of the Episcopalian Church that came from this particular name. But it's the mentality, and the word itself means overseer. It means overseer. It underscores the mentality and function of the spiritual leaders who are, act, are to act as overseers regarding the spiritual care of the local church. The word epi means over. In fact, your skin is called epa what? Epidermis, right? This is, the, this is what covers the insides of you. It's the epidermis. It's over the rest of it. Well, epikopos is a term that means over. And so it's a, it was equivalent, it's the Greek equivalent to the Jewish, ancient Jewish term for elder. And so bishops are appointed as overseers. Now, what is one term that is not used to describe the spiritual leader of a church? It's reverend. The word reverend, and there's a guy at the Y that always calls me the reverend. He doesn't know any better. and I don't make a big deal about it, but that's what he's taught. He was taught... Here's the reverend over there. No, that's a term that's really designed to be used for God alone. Psalms 111 verse 9 says, 
He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. And so it's a term, but in our culture, that's terms thrown around. In fact, if you read obituaries, it'll explain where the funeral or memorial service is going to be, and it says the reverend so-and-so is going to do it. They don't know any better either. And so holy and reverend is God's name. So how are all these terms related to each other? Well, let's go to Acts chapter 20. Paul. Luke is describing Paul's last meeting with the Ephesian elders. If you look at verse 17, what do we read? From Miletus, he, Paul, sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, and we can continue reading. And notice what verse 28 says. Therefore, he says to the elders, you take heed to yourself, to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. And so Acts 20, 28, I have it up here on the screen. This is written to the elders. This is spoken rather to the elders. What were the elders to do? Notice, who made them overseers? the Holy Spirit. There's a gift, a spiritual gift, and as the maturity of that individual uh, comes to realization, they're appointed as an overseer, and what is their ministry? The shepherd, that's the word for pastor. They're the shepherd of the church of God, notice which Jesus Christ purchased with his own blood. And so these terms are used interchangeably. In fact, notice how Peter used it in his epistle. The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. What is an elder to do? Shepherd or pastor, the flock of God, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. And so the pastor or elder is to take oversight of what takes place in the local body. Now, the, a number of things can be delegated, and they need to be delegated, but the Holy Spirit has placed elders over the flock so that they oversee it and so that they shepherd it. And so the elder focuses on the character qualities of the man. We're going to see here in a future study. Now the question we could ask is, well, how many elders, bishops, or pastors should a local church have? Theoretically, um, and this is a source of contention, which has actually backfired in many cases, some churches have written a constitution that says, well, we need to have four elders. Well, you only have two that are qualified, so what do they do then? They make two guys elders. They have no business making elders. And they bring the whole thing down. And I've seen it happen twice firsthand. They said, well, our Constitution says we've got to have four of them. And so we'll pick Joe Schmo from Kokomo over here. But he doesn't have enough. He's not either gifted, doesn't have the maturity. And in one situation, this guy brought the whole thing down because, well, mostly because of his wife. But that's a different deal, but they took the whole church down because he was not to be an elder. A church has as many elders as God gives it. The Bible nowhere prescribes a certain number, but elders is found in the plural, and so the a plurality, a plurality of elders is God's ideal and goal for all growing churches. And so we're getting there, and we're going we're gonna to do that. And so it's important to understand these things. 
And so, we'll get, see how far we can get here. Let's look at the posture of the pasture. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Notice verse 12. And we urge your brethren to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. And so, the pastor is to function among you. Notice how he describes, he's describing elders here, and he's describing specifically how the congregation is to respond to their elder. But he says, to recognize those who notice labor among you. Among you. And this really underscores and emphasizes in, a, in an indirect way the importance of the body concept. In order for a pastor to be an effective pastor, he has to be among the people. This is how God designed this to work. Imagine if my hand was separated from the rest of me. How effective would it be? It wouldn't be effective at all. And in some cases, pastors are aloof from their congregations. You know, there was a church in Kansas where, though it was doctrinally sound, the pastor would show up, preach his message, and walk out the back door. Didn't interact with anybody. And the church was ice cold. The church had a lousy body concept. There was no ministry going on. In fact, five minutes after the church was over, the lights were off, and everybody was gone. I can't even think about it. The whole thing of it makes me crawl. It makes my skin crawl. And you see, God wants all of us to think in terms of a body, think in terms... You know, I'm not going to get anywhere. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12. Well, let's stop at 1 Corinthians 3. Now, what do we know about this Corinthian church? Yes, chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, cannot speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, for even now you're still not able. Why? You're still carnal. There's envy, strife, and divisions among you. Are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? One says, I'm of Paul. The other, I'm of Apollos. Are you not carnal? But notice he says, I fed you with milk because you were not able to take it. Verse 3, 1 says, you're like babes in Christ. There's immaturity. When there's immaturity and carnality within the body, what do you have? Envy, strife, and division. And this is how he explained to them later. If you go to chapter 12, You know, think of a baby. How, how concerned is a baby about its mother's sleep, mother's well-being, you know? <laughs> a baby could care less. They're completely self-absorbed and self-centered. And the parallel is true. If I'm a carnal Christian, who am I thinking about? Me. Am I thinking about your well-being? No, I'm thinking about what are you doing for me, man? I'm not thinking about what I can do for you. And so a sign of maturity in the Lord is you're not going to ask the question, what about me? You're going to ask, no, what can I do, Lord, for someone else? That's how you know. If you want to know if you're maturing in the Lord, it's not all about you. So if it's all about you, what should I tell you? And when it's all about me, the natural byproduct has to be envy, strife, and division because someone is not playing my game. Someone is not cooperating with me. Someone is not meeting my expectations, and I think they're my problem. 
that shows I'm carnal. And that's not how God designed this thing. You know, it's interesting, verse 11 of chapter 12 says, the same spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, works in all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. In other words, the spirit of God decided what spiritual gift you have. And he's trying to work in you and through you, so when you function in the body of Christ, you're there for its edification. You're a yielded vessel that says, what can I do to make the body better? Not, eh, look at her. Blech. That has nothing to do with it. When you're thinking like that, you're thinking about you again. You're immature, and you're causing envy, strife, and division. But he explains in verse 12, is the body has one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we're all baptized into one body. We're in this together. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we've all been made to drink in one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. Now if the foot should say, I'm not the hand, does that mean I'm not of the body? So here we have some envy going on, okay? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eyeball, I'm not of the body, you know, is your ear important? What if you had 16 eyes and no ears? What kind of body would you have? You'd be a freak, you know? People would run. You wouldn't be a high-functioning body at all. But I want to be an ear. I want to be a foot. I want to be a navel. I don't know why you'd want to be a navel. <laughs> it's like being an armpit, right? Oh, okay, where am I? Uh, verse 17, yeah. If the whole body were an eyeball, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the eye? But now notice, this is important. God has set the members, each one of them, in the body as, as he pleased. God put us all together because this pleased him because he knows what we can all do when we're yielded vessels to edify one another. So to think you're not an important part of the body is to be, is to be off. He says if everyone were, verse 19, if, if they were all one member, where would the body be? We can't all be navels or ears or eyes. But indeed, there are many members, yet we're still in this together. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. That's carnality. Nor, again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which think to be less honorable, and these would bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. In other words, we all need, need each other, and we're all designed to help each other meet different needs. We all have different strengths and weaknesses. We're all to be on the same page, being of one mind, one accord, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And we need each other. This is how God designed this thing. But our presentable parts have no need, but God composed the body, having given greater honor to that which lacks it. To what end, verse 25? That there be no schism in the body. No division, but the members of the body should have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, then we all suffer with it. If one member is honored, then we're all in this together. We all rejoice with it. And you are a body of Christ and members individually. And so all of us are, have the same mindset about being amongst one another. I can't imagine my life without a local church. I'd have to find, figure out something to do to fill the void. It would be total vanity. I mean, I can't think of, I mean, I'd have to fill the void. This is what the unsaved are doing. They're completely void of purpose. They try to fill it with something. They throw themselves into something, and when that runs out of steam, they'll go do something else. The average unbeliever is looking from one event to the next event to the next event, something to fill the void because it's empty. It doesn't really deliver. And this is why we've got the greatest purpose. We've been gifted to function, and we can help each other about that which really matters. That's why the body of Christ is just everything to me. And I don't, can't, I don't understand how it isn't, there's an ant in here, how it is for everyone else. I mean, every, there's something floating all of our boats here. There's something tripping all of our triggers. Are you allowing the Spirit of God to take the Word of God and these amazing truths so that you're thinking you conform to what Christ says matters, so that we can actually redeem the time together and make hay, 
You don't know what's around the corner. Some epidemic could show up other than the coronavirus and then all those things people live for are going to be meaningless. So God has given you the right gift to function in the body here, but we're to be among one another. That's why Hebrew says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. But so much the more as we see the day approaching. Well, so much for that. I'm out of time. And we'll have to pick this up next time by God's grace. Let's pray. Father, we're just humbled again as we can see your great wisdom in making the body of Christ and we're all part of it. I pray that we'd hold this in high esteem as you do. Jesus Christ is our head. He gave us all. He purchased us with his own blood. He's placed us together. He's gifted us to function. I pray we wouldn't be like immature, carnal babes like Corinthians and think only about ourselves and, and cause envy, strife, and division, but we'd prefer one another in love. That would he let this mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus, who humbly served and did the will of God for the benefit of all of us. So we pray that he would have the preeminence in our thinking and would allow the word of God to truly direct us for your glory. And we're so thankful for the spirit of God to be able to make it happen. So we thank you for these things and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.